So I'd like to welcome you again, if you've been here before or for the first time to our latest Integrated Adaptive Cyber Defense Community Day. I'm Wendy Peters. I'm a member of the staff here at APL and have been involved in our active cyber defense and our integrated adaptive cyber defense work for quite some time. I'm required as the cruise director of this particular voyage to tell you that the restrooms are on the other side of the guard desk out in the lobby and that you should note your closest fire exit. In the event of an emergency, please make your way safely with your exit buddy to, to whatever exit is closest to you. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to one of our government sponsors to welcome you on behalf of their efforts, and then we'll get started. Good morning, my name's Michael Herring. I am the NSA lead for IACD. Oh, um, sorry. Integrated Adaptive Cyber Defense is uh, a jointly sponsored effort, so everything you're gonna hear about today has been jointly sponsored by the National Security Agency and DHS. My DHS as partners on the front row there are Tom Ruoff, Brian Doan, and Juan Gonzalez. So on behalf of the National Security Agency, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth Community Day for Integrated Adaptive Cyber Defense. Um, this day is for you, a community of stakeholders, who share an interest in improving cybersecurity through the automation and integration of cyberspace defenses. Since the last time we brought you together, we've had some notable accomplishments. We've completed two additional spirals of activity here at APL and planned the next, our seventh overall. Um, We've published a few more ACD-related papers and technical publications, including an overview of the IACD capabilities-based architecture in preparation for releasing the full architecture later this year, and made significant progress in producing the first IACD-related standard, OpenC2. At the same time, we've seen a surge in demand for security orchestration that's led to new entrants in the market. Finally, we've made great strides in IACD knowledge sharing that's led to a number of initial operational deployments, ranging from early planning to nearly complete, as well as enabling capability integrators both within and outside the government to establish their own IACD development efforts. Today, we're gonna to provide some generic descriptions of deployments, and at least one will be highlighted later in the JHU presentation. As you may surmise from this, we have reached a transformative stage in our initiative in which we will begin to focus less on proof of principle work and more on transforming what we've learned to network, transferring what we've learned to network owners for use in improving the speed and scale of their network defenses. Going forward, we're gonna focus our experimental efforts on answering a few last outstanding questions and exploring advanced use cases for IECD, such as automated resiliency and regeneration, automated defense that spans the IT OT boundary to defend ICS SCADA systems at speed and scale, and the use of IECD concepts to integrate and enhance the capabilities of existing cybersecurity programs of record. We have a very full agenda today and we're excited to share with you, including some guest speakers from industry. But we're also keenly interested in hearing comments, questions, and ideas from you, our stakeholder community of interest. To that end, we invite you to join one of the feedback sessions scheduled immediately following the presentation today. Again, welcome, and we look forward to sharing our recent successes with you, as well as hearing your thoughts on our way forward. Thank you for joining us here today. Now I'll turn the podium over to Wendy. So you should should all be very impressed with my organizational skills. I messed up the order in the first four slides. So before I go into my presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the agenda in part just to prepare you that there are a few changes from what was published in the invitation and on the website. Most of them aren't that obvious to you. Um, 
There had been plans for a couple of my colleagues here at APL to present certain sections, and due to illness and family emergencies, you got a lot more me, so I'm sure you're thrilled. However, our technical team is going to do some demonstrations, and that'll give you a break from this. Um, in addition, um, our panel members, we had planned to have a panel in here talking about security and trust issues. Trust issues, that's great. Um, <laughs> I have trust issues. Security and trust with regards to integration and automation. Um, a couple of them also could not make it, so Harley Parks, who is the lead of our systems development effort, who was gonna be on the panel anyway, is going to lead a facilitated discussion, but we're actively looking for a back and forth with the audience, um, but we're not gonna line you up here in front of the room, I think. And then one of the people that's representing uh, FireEye had to send someone else, and they'll be talking in a little bit. But pretty much we're sticking to the same flow. Now we can go to where I should have had the agenda. So I'm gonna spend some time giving you a little bit of background and overview of what we've done before. If you've been to these, I'm trying hard to balance the what you've seen coming to previous events versus what's new, but also give an introduction for those who haven't been part of the conversation till now. Um, there's no way that I could name everybody on the team individually that's had a hand in this work, but it's an amazing team. Part of what some people might not be aware of is that APL has blended its teams working uh, the automated indicator sharing and information sharing work down at DHS with the IACD work so that we can start to pursue what had already been planned, which is a tight coupling between information sharing at machine speed and the ability to use that shared information to trigger cyber defense mechanisms. So we have that team is here in the room, both our capabilities and our adoption team, my own leadership team for the overall effort, our development and test environment team who run the fire lab are here Systems engineering, ops and mission planning, which is intended to be a new portion of our outreach to work with operational units and people seeking to adopt this to learn what the best information that you need to have in order to train, make useful to your operations, and make sustainable to your operations, IACD capabilities, our specification and standards effort, and our systems development team. Different people will be called out at different times and during our breakout sessions, some of them will be you know, signaling to you to, if you want to talk about technology, go over here. If you want to talk about getting involved in one of the demonstrations, come over there. Um, but in general, if you're looking for additional information, this goes to several of our team leads, and then we will sort it out according to what your inquiry is. So I've started many of my briefs over a year and a half with this slide, and I keep telling myself I'm going to update it with the newer things, but this gra these graphics are not matched by some of the other graphics. Uh, on the left is a couple years ago, FireEye Mandiant Report, which tells us what most of us already know, which is that it, we measure in hundreds of days the typical time between a successful breach by our adversaries and the actual detection of it. And by far, we're more likely to have someone else inform us, an intelligence agency, a law enforcement agency, or one of our customers that we were breached than to discover it ourselves. On the right is, and am I doing that right? L for left. Uh, on the right is from a couple years ago, Verizon Breach Report. The blue line is the percentage of, I'm sorry, the red line is the percentage of breaches where the target or the intent of the adversary was met within the first 24 hours. The blue line is the percentage of breaches where we detected it within the first 24 hours. So we've actually been steadily worse at this over the last decade. Last year, I think the stats showed a little dip inward and it was good, and then the year after it spread back out. So starting with that reality means we talk, we talk about what it takes to change our reality. We're looking at the application of automation and integration at a scale such that you can react in cyber relevant time. That does not mean full scale automation. It does not mean that um, everything needs to be dealt with in milliseconds, but it does say I wanna change the game and talk about the ability to do that. In addition, I want the automation and the control to be both dialable, so it's selectable according to your operational needs and your comfort with that degree of automation, but also explicitly under the control of the local network operator and owner, or however you define ownership within your enterprise. This isn't about a big brother program or a capability that's re reaching in. It's how you could take advantage of the technologies today to ensure that you apply your rules of engagement, your business rules, your priorities in this way. 
We want to support both the existing and emerging standards or efforts leading towards standardization because the real intent here is that this should be achievable through commercial products, which is why so many of you are from the vendor community and we're desperately looking to partner so that we talk about things that are marketably sustainable and in fact in line with business needs, not a grand research idea or a government program that's directing how things should be done. It's really about what can be done with what's out there. Overall, and in particular with DHS, we've, they've defined this as the goal to move cyber defense out of that month time period and gradually move us towards milliseconds. Not everything needs to be milliseconds and we're not gonna apologize for not having everything already at milliseconds. But every place that we start to move towards a better time frame on that scale changes the game for what we're dealing with. So you heard Michael talk about the fact that we've shifted emphasis over the last year, eight months or so. Uh, for those of you who have come to several of these, we spent much of our early spirals proving it can be done, surveying the community and the market to understand even what's out there and starting to work through how one might put those together. Um, we've proved that it can be done. We have partners throughout government and private sector who are doing it. And so our emphasis has shifted to what does it take to get what's possible now out there and what does it take to influence to make it useful to the, those who haven't adopted it yet. And so the roadmap our combined sponsors have put together focused on things we need to do with regards to supply, demand, and adoption. From the supply perspective, what we're looking for is to make sure that we publish and maintain a consistent and extensible functional architecture, not a detailed requirements list, not 47 pages of diagrams, but a consistent vocabulary of what we're talking about that is vetted by and contributed to by the industry so that everyone knows what we mean when we say we want a kafuzel and it attaches to the green thing. Whatever that might answer may be, we're all gonna mean the same thing. We're also seeking to encourage a robust market of vendors and suppliers, people who provide the components that perform IACD, as well as a community of integrators and service providers who know how to put it together for you. So this needs to not be a top-down program, and it needs to not be a government-directed program, but an effort that is out there that's supportable so that you can find a place that can help you put it in, into position. From the demand side, we need to be able to articulate in a visible, well-understood way what the return on investment is to operations. And so we've done some numbers, and you've seen some scorecards, you'll hear me talk about it again, but the real point in our partnership with the pilot organizations and the outside organizations is to A, better understand what they actually define as good or success or improvement, and B, start to find out whether we're really meeting that mark or whether we need to change things or recommend certain capabilities be put in place in order to meet that mark. We also are looking to engage with active user communities or facilitate active user communities so that we can start talking. What does it mean to share a playbook or share defenses? What does it mean to talk about training an organization to use this? And what if I lose that person and they go somewhere else and I'm gonna be able to train the next one? Um, and we need to make sure that we're facilitating the availability of these capabilities at a variety of cost and complexity levels. Uh, if you've got a multi-million dollar security budget, well, that's great, and thank goodness. But if your Skippy the intern doubles your staff on your security ops team every summer, you still need to be able to take advantage of this in some way. And then from an adoption point of view, we, we are really looking at what does it mean to be repeatable and trainable, as well as what does it mean to sustain this capability and not turn this into an operations and maintenance nightmare where you're constantly refreshing things that you otherwise would not have to do. So all of that are the challenges that the government has placed before us and that we together are placing for the, before the community saying, it's not so much proving to you anymore that we can do automation. It's saying, what do we need to do about how we specify the automation, how we talk about how you use these products in order to make these a better reality. So we'll see how we've done. Um, at its core, if you've seen this all before, IACD is based on an idea of applying sensing, sense making, decision making and acting in an automated and integrated way to change our timeline and change our effectiveness. It has always been meant to be and has always continued to be spoken about as informed by and informing information sharing and shared situational awareness, why it, which is why it's been so important for us to bring our information sharing teams together with our IACD teams. We are not in the job to tell you what the best of breed of something is. We're not doing a trade 
based off of the best IDS or the best host endpoint management capability. At its core, our idea is that you bring your own enterprise, BYOE. Um, I'm not gonna talk about how you need to add something, but whatever you bring to the table, I need to be able to talk about what are the services components, products that you need in order to piece together what you have. Two relatively inexpensive defense mechanisms or the most sophisticated detection mechanisms in the world that you've paid tons of money for and you have a multi-dozen person staff running. Whatever that reality is, we want to talk about, as I like to say, the tree, not the ornaments. I want you to be able to switch on and off whatever things that you want to plug in, but I also want to be able to talk about how you could switch out the trees because we're not looking to change where you're vendor locked. If you're vendor locked into certain defense capabilities right now, me telling you, great, you could be vendor locked into an, an integration capability, so now you can plug and play those, but you're tied here. Um, and no offense to our wonderful partners who provide those services, but the real goal is to come up with standards that allow you to have that freedom. So IECD success from our perspective does look like what I've talked a lot about, which is the intra-enterprise, the ability to integrate and automate across sense, sense making, decision making, and acting, but it's not sufficient. We also assume that there's a set of trusted information sharing mechanisms or components that are available so that enterprises that are equipped with IECD capabilities are able to be stimulated by outside information and able to share with communities of trust what they've learned. Um, which is why, you know, so you can talk about that as being the AIS program that has stood up. It can be being a member of an ISAL or an ISAC that employs machine speed information sharing. There are dozens of mechanisms and communities that are emerging to do that, but a necessary part of a successful ecosystem includes the ability to hook up to those and the existence of them. And then there's a set of, the construct of a set of trusted cyber services, which we're really just starting to match against. Some of them are easier to understand. The idea that you might want to make at, be able to access consistently reputation sources or scoring, um, and you want to be able to plug and play which one of those services or feeds you're able to put in, or you want to be able to, to dial your own levels for that. But we also anticipate that there are other top-level services that we're really sort of just in, beginning to identify. Our next spiral, which focuses on trust components, might very well elicit some of those, because one can imagine the machine-level identity equivalent of identity management services needing to be put in place in order for you to manage command and control at NetSpeed. So what we've built out over the last year, the architecture that Michael um, spoke about, can be represented at, at this very top level by our functional model. So those ornaments on the tree are in this blue box. We've spent a significant amount of time describing what the services would need to be in order to move from sensing components through acting and what kind of orchestration capability or ma overall management of those services would need to exist in order to, uh, put, to put into place the automation capabilities. In addition, there are corresponding information or content feeds that go hand in hand with this. I can't talk about something that issues response actions if I don't have a consistent way to define what a response action is and how vendors could follow that in order to have theirs plug and play as well. We've always assumed that there's an underlying infrastructure. This, is, this can be a logical separation. It's perfectly reasonable to have your command and control messages and your data messages traveling over the same plane. However, there are gonna be places where security or uh, volume or any number of other reasons would drive you to want to have a separated plane for command and control versus a data plane. And we're working through what the definition of that is. We've consistently told our partners we're not interested in a new plane of glass. So this is not at all about saying what is your best dashboard, but we do expect that you have plugs that you can plug into any one of the number of SIMs or dashboards or management capabilities that our operations personnel routinely rely on. And then our biggest challenge is what does the, both the traditional security stack, the things we think about in security, but also the things that we're just beginning to talk about, confidence management levels, trust in the authenticity of the command as much as the accuracy or the authorization of the, the issuer of the command. That's the component we've talked about. So the more broken out architecture that Michael referred to, the things that are starting to be published, all drive back to this model. And we've also spent some time saying that's great, but each of us, I just said everyone could bring their own enterprise and roll their own. So if each of you have a different IACD enabled enterprise put in together in a certain way, we've also been getting to talk about what does it look like to mesh those together. 
fundamentally, you have to assume you start with information sharing um, at a minimum. The, the ideas of what we already have in terms of automated indicator sharing and some of the advances that are being made there, you might eventually move towards a multi-location command and control interface for signaling. We don't know yet. We haven't examined fully what makes sense, but we're looking for feedback from people who use this and people who might use it in small ways or very large ways to understand how to specify that. And then in the end, it's great for us all to talk about a traditional enterprise with a boundary, and except that all the young people that are working with us are reading about that in chapter one of their textbooks because it's history. Um, so we need to move towards the idea of what does it really look like for this to be provided as a service to an enterprise you own, or if yours is entirely a virtualized service-based enterprise where you do not own the underlying infrastructure that might signal that you have a problem, but you do own the mission, which sets the, the levels of when risk has been exceeded. And so we're just merging into the kinds of experiments that allow us to talk about what the trade-offs are there. So our approach has been, and I've certainly referred to it multiple times now, is that we build essentially reference implementations on a 90 to 120 day schedule. Um, early on, it was the try something and put it all together. I'm gonna talk about that. But the intent is to rapidly say, these are things that work, these are concepts that move forward, to identify challenges. You know, there are no products that currently connect together this way and we think it absolutely has to happen or you can't automate that step. We wanna be able to provide those gaps back, both to the people who commercially make available tools as well as researchers if there aren't tools. And that's one of the sets of feedback we're gonna be asking for towards the end of the day. Uh, we've done a fairly good job with people who are already partnered with us in some of our earlier demonstrations of consistently sharing, here's what we've learned about orchestration. Uh, we need to find a more effective measure of getting that out to com companies and components that aren't involved in the demonstrations, but definitely offer those services. And so that's part of how we're gonna be looking to engage is what's the most effective means to do that. And then all of this has been to gather requirements, or requirements may be too strong a word, gather the common specifications such that if standardization is the right route, and I don't know if it is, but if standardization is the right route, we've captured a consistent set of specifications that people can build to. So I'm supposed to give you a little bit of background of what we've done to date, and I'm trying desperately to make sure I get us either ahead of schedule or on schedule. Um, if you've seen this before, I'm going to go into a summary. I'm not gonna go into to any depth here. However, if you do have specific questions about any one of the spirals, um, you're certainly free to raise your hand and, and I'm happy to take questions, but amongst the things that we will be available for at the breakout sessions is to talk in depth a little bit more about previous spirals if you wanna hear more. Um, so even though I didn't go to business school, I've been taught that I'm supposed to tell you what I'm gonna tell you, then tell you, then tell you afterwards what I told you. So I'm gonna tell you that there were multiple spirals and that we just approach each of those with a certain theme. If you've gone to enough of these, you'll notice that sometimes my description of what the theme is, say of spiral two, is different than if you were at spiral one and you heard me say, the upcoming theme is gonna be this. Because the whole point is that we discover things and sometimes we go down a path and realize what we thought we were looking at is pretty much um, trivial. However, what we really need to go after is a different area. But these are our consistent themes. Um, for each one of those, we have combined a series of different integrations of, for the most part, commercial technologies. Our early spirals, some of it had to be hand jammed, some of it had to be our own creation. But our steady progressive goal has been that there is almost nothing that we're coding and for the most part, we're applying configuration settings. Um, through Spiral 5, these are the components we've worked to. If you've been here before or if your company's on this, I have in fact re reorganized the page. So you know, you're still there, but look for yourself. It's like finding Waldo. Um, and we have consistently seen, demonstrated or observed a set of gains. Our capacity for how many events we're able to manage or mitigate in a certain time frame continues to go up. Our timelines for how quickly we can respond to things have consistently gone down. Our flexibility, in other words, of how much we can plug and play has improved dramatically, and I have another graphic for, about that towards the end. And the type of complexity of scenarios and the interplay of multiple um, automation paths has continued to increase. These are the gains we've seen. So I'm telling you what I'm gonna tell you. 
Let me talk a little bit about what we've done. Every spiral begins with a set of driving questions. If you have anyone, a child between fourth grade and eighth grade, first, semester, first month of science is always about the scientific method. We start with a basic hypothesis and we run somewhat of an experiment. Um, and if it turns out that it doesn't work, well, that's as important as finding out that it did work. But for us, it's the, can I do the following things? What could I do to do the following things? For spiral zero, we essentially, it was our baselining. We had to um, see if, could we do integration and automation using largely commercial products? And could we baseline at least some operational experience so that we refer, if we refer back to things, we're able to give us a consistent reference point. Um, every one of our spirals, I'll talk through a little mall map of what we did. In this particular case, we did a very simple workflow. We focused on automated enrichment of a triggering event. So something happens and I go to automatically to a variety of other sources to get the most combined information about that event in order to make a decision. We made a course level decision. That early decision was literally so bad we should stop it, so obviously good I can let it go and everything in between is phone a friend, call a human, let someone know. Um, this investment was, uh, this integration was done both in our laboratory settings but a portion of it was done on our operational networks here at APL in order to actually make use of a fully um, stimulated environment and a security stack of technologies that were active in other things in addition to just an experiment. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the ideas, but it essentially started on the left-hand side with, hey, I've got a pointer, with a host having an unknown file on an application whitelisted um, platform the execution of that file was blocked because application whitelisting works, and if you haven't adopted it yet, go for it. However, we're also using application whitelisting as a sensor, and we went through a, let me enrich it with what other people say about what I've learned, let me see my history about what I've seen in the past. I can, bits are free, and I don't have to have a human do this, so I can go ask for a copy of the file and detonate it in a detonation chamber in order to see if there are other things I should look at, and eventually I would get to a point of, definitely bad, definitely good, or phone a friend. Um, and in the few cases where we actually, oh, sorry, in the few cases where we actually decided to implement automation, it was essentially block the IP address either at the firewall or through our IDS and, or, and, and block the file from being able to run on our network. So it was a relatively straightforward thing. We did not split the atom, this wasn't amazing, but it did allow us to baseline against real world data that we had. So APL is an enterprise, and this is about two-year-old statistics, and the man who runs the system is right over here in front of me. So if I'm wrong, he's gonna tell me to start giving new statistics. But um, our 6,000-person laboratory with all of the different nodes we have generates about a billion events a day in our security apparatus, and obviously most of that is filtered out and goes through a variety of things. We have, of those billion events, about 65 a day actually make it to our first to your responders, the first level who's gonna have a human put eyes on it. That's a good number. That's actually a very decent percentage. Most of that stuff is in noise and for operations components, that's pretty good. Um, just as a hint, of those billion, about 50,000 of them are the kind that I talked about where one of our application whitelisted protected platforms attempts to execute a file that wasn't on the whitelist. What we saw is that when we worked on those things, when one of those 50,000 actually made the 65 that made it to a human, our best case is that it took us 10 minutes to get to the decision point. Definitely bad, definitely good, or let me escalate to the next level analyst. Our worst case was 11 hours. 11 hours could have a lot of reasons, but I'm pretty proud of that because 203 days on that other um, chart that I showed you. But when we put our automation in place, just one small workflow for one specific trigger, what we saw was that our best case became our worst case. The longest it took us to reach that same decision point was 10 minutes. The quickest we reached that same decision point was one second. And so I've reduced my timeline dramatically, amazingly. Orders of magnitude that, do, that um, come into play when you talk about other things, about you know, triaging or putting in place the best things at the top of your analyst queue. But more importantly, I no longer have to talk about, am I lucky enough that one of those 65 are these 50,000? I was able to, with a single sandboxing device, um, handle anywhere from 24 to 96 of those simultaneously. So I could scale fairly effectively with, and fairly inexpensively to do all of those 50,000 or a huge amount of those 50,000 with no additional analyst hours at all. 
Um, and for a very small portion of those, we said, look, we are in fact prepared to say block that IP address, update the firewall. And it took us about an additional 30 to 60 seconds to act in order to do that. And our com so our comparison was we saved in terms of capacity, we saved in terms of um, time, and we saved in terms of operator hours. So our next spiral was, all right, can we do it all again, but do it for a variety of, of, of ornaments and a variety of trees? Um, and can we de demonstrate how important and effective the interplay of multiple organizations using information sharing and automated information sharing would be in order to trigger different parts of your communities to protect themselves? And then could we highlight the dialable level of automation construct? So in that case, we did exactly what you saw me describe there. But we built several other enterprises with different orchestration components. Some of them had IDSs or of different elks. Some of them had detonation. Some of them did not. They would depend on their partner to have done this. But the whole point was that one, whoop, I have absolutely no idea what I just did. Sorry. Let's hope it just stays there. You have no idea how our day is going, guys, since 5.30 this morning, but that's, you're pretty lucky the lights came back on. Um, so one of them was fully automated. The other said, you know what? I'm gonna expect a human in the loop or on the loop for the whole time. So give me all the information to help the human make a decision, but I'm gonna click go. I'm not gonna take you through all the details here, but basically we ranged everything from exactly the ornaments that you heard described before to an enterprise that's using essentially open source or relatively inexpensive or components that come with Microsoft licenses in order to do very similar things. And they have a human in the loop. And NSA helped us build out an HBSS equipped environment so that we would reflect what was currently available on DOD networks. Our results there, we're comparing apples to apples, comparing the previous spiral. The same sort of idea of from the time I receive an indicator to the point that I decide and then I defend myself, I'm keeping to anywhere from the second that I've seen. Instead of 10 minutes, I'm talking eight minutes. We got a little better at tuning, but obviously that's up to you and how you, long you wish to dwell or how many different enrichments that you wanna make. It took me at most an extra minute total, but I'm able to start that in parallel to craft a warning, craft a stick formatted message to warn my partners. And then from there, my partners were able to process my message, make a decision whether or not it applies to them and I should have, have it defend my network in less than a minute if it's fully automated. And then anywhere from a minute to 45 minutes. And I'm using 45 minutes as the average for an analyst to handle a ticket. Your mileage may vary, but we are definitely talking about minutes instead of months now. Our next spiral focused on, really focused on the decision-making complexity. So we didn't spend as much time saying, what are all the triggering events? I'm not trying to get the best malware to force a certain condition on my detection mechanisms. And it's not so much about how I implement responses, but I do need to know what responses are available to me. What I really want to know is, can I make the environment so complex that we start to reflect decisions that aren't really, really bad, really, really good, and everything else I don't know. In this case, we wanted to have decision scenarios that were forced by local conditions. Are you at risk or not? Do you have operational critical activity occurring on the platform in question or not? And we wanted to explore if you had all that complexity, but you also add the volume and number of indicators that we're talking about our communities beginning to adapt to. The idea of automated information sharing in theory is a great idea. Great, I'm now gonna have a thousand times more information for my same analyst staff to handle. Um, so we wanted to say, could we maintain the timelines we had, but do it in the face of a large influx of significantly more information? And could we talk about what it means to pre-approve a select set of things for automation, but keep a human in the loop option for a lot of things? And what does it mean to change those levels? So those were our driving questions. We went through a whole set of decision complexity in terms of what type of indicator is it and who sent it to me? How much do I trust you? Are you usually good for stuff? You not so much, but you I'm required by law to listen to, so I have to read it even though we know it doesn't work. And being able to apply that kind of decisions. What's the reputation sources I have available to me to double check your thinking on whether or not I should take action on that? And how much quality and, and confidence do I place in each one of those? 
What's my own history? Has this worked before? Did it not work before? Did I get in trouble before? What's my risk posture? Is it about a vulnerability that I only have running on one machine off in a corner? Or is it about something that is targeting my most mission critical machine, which goes hand in hand with my most critical machine being targeted could be really, really important to me. However, if the only mitigation I have available to take that offline, the impact of taking something out of ops may be worse than the impact of, of letting the risk go through. And then ultimately, what's available to me in order to to take action. If I only have a screwdriver and a hammer, there's no point in talking about complex quarantine redirection into virtualized honeypots. That's all nice and good, but if you basically can stop it or let it through, you change what your decision properties might be. So this environment was really all about flooding with indicators. We used uh, sticks formatted indicators in a, in a feed that approximates what an AIS feed would look like, but we also, as a Defense industrial base member, a DIB member, flooded it with indicators that come in typical DIB format. And the whole point was to go through a flow where you have a significantly larger, more expansive set of reputation sources, all with their own weights and triggers involved. You also started looking at the net flow itself, as well as the configuration and operational status of your host environments so that you know what's active, what's patched, what's not patched, what mission criticality you place to different operations. And we put in place what's available to me, should I act, was the most important decision to be made. So it wasn't the decision of what action to take, but should I act, and which order should I act, and what's the priority was the focus we had. Um, what we saw for that is that we were able to flood our system with anywhere from 10 to 100 times the volume of indicators we typically receive and we kept the timelines that you've seen before. So we have a more complex decision-making process, uh, doing hundreds more of what we've typically had, and we're still keeping the timelines on a per indicator basis. And in addition, the, what I found most interesting, we set really stringent criteria. Only the most egregious risks with the lowest regret. So something that's really, really bad, and if I take action, I either don't have anything running that right now, or it, it is the volleyball league scores on the side server in the DMZ or something. Only those were pre-approved for automation. Everything else had to go into a ticket where the operator would be told, we think you should block this, but they would click it. Um, and even though we set that criteria, over 70% of what we were receiving is largely stuff that we would filter out as high risk, low regret, you might as well handle it. And that confirms what a lot of people anecdotally talk about is that they think a lot of their feeds aren't actually giving them stuff that keep them up at night, but since they don't know which one is the one, then they spend a lot of time sorting through those. Our spiral after that was focused on getting inside the kill chain. So most of the other ones we had demonstrated and fed things that were about indicators or things that warned you, but you weren't necessarily under attack right at that moment. Our following spiral said, all right, we're gonna go spy versus spy. We're going to attack with a specific target in mind, the enterprise we've emulated, and have our orchestrated mechanisms sort of head to head up against those and see what happens. Can we get inside their kill chain timeline? Can we get left of boom? Are we able to drive a decision where multiple threads and events, which might look like any one automated thread, but it's the accumulation of those that actually tips the scales and we say we have to take action? And then we did an extra leap of saying, we've been sharing indicators of compromise. What if we attempted to use the same mechanism, sticks and taxi, to share an abstraction of a course of action instead of just the indicator of compromise? In that case, as I just mentioned, we had a variety of threads that were triggering, um, that were being watched by orchestration mechanism, and it's the pattern of events that led them to decide to take action. But in addition, they abstracted it out and said, okay, I." I learned a lesson, this is my whole thing with teenagers. You'd love it if they would just learn from your mistakes so that you don't have to do it again. Instead of them having to go out and make the same mistake, I can package up the lesson. When this happened, this happened, and this happened, I had to wait for all three things to happen to realize I was under attack, and now I, then I took action. I'm warning you, if you see these three early indicators, put them together, you should just block it before you have to learn the hard way. We used a modified version of the stick structure in order to send it to other, another enterprise. 
and then attacked another enterprise in a similar way, but not identically. This isn't about signature sharing. This was about behaviors being similar in terms of our attackers, not the actual attack itself. Um, what we saw, what we put in place is an enterprise that was, I'm not gonna hit the button where everything goes off, an enterprise that was focused on doing exactly what I just described, and then an enterprise that needed to say, yes, I will accept the lesson that's learned. I'm gonna put the lesson into my orchestration component, and then we attacked that and saw a different outcome. With the one that was learning first, the one who's learning how to fish so they can teach you how to fish, um, our adversary kill chain was about three and a half minutes consistently. We knew we could go from clicking on a spear phishing email through infiltration, escalation of privileges, lateral movement, and exfiltration off of a mission critical machine in three and a half minutes. No one's surprised by that, but that was the attack vector we were using. Um, we needed to see if our environment could beat that. You needed to be able to detect it was happening. And we did, we were consistently getting within three minutes, but understand this critically. Um, you can't compare this to the, well, what about where you detected things in a second or you did it in less than a minute earlier? Keep in mind, it had to be this behavior and 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 the additive of all of those occurring is what it took to tip the scale. So you can't change dramatically sort of the first instance of learning how to defend against this because you needed to wait, your orchestrator needed to see that whole set of patterns. But if I'm able to then say, hey, I've learned a lesson, you only have to hear the first three notes of the song in order to make a decision. What we saw in our other enterprise is that once we warned them about those first three notes, when the adversary was early in their chain, they were able to block it before they even got a complete foothold on the initial point of infiltration. So they weren't able to escalate privileges, they weren't able to laterally move. And so we saw a dramatic effect out of that. Our spiral four, and some of you were involved in this, took a different turn. We have spirals that were very much about proving something. This is where we got into, all right, if we're really gonna seriously start getting into the idea of standardization and modularization so that you could plug and play, then what's the right level of abstraction? How deep or, or far out from the different messages that these components interchange do we need to go so that it's feasible for multiple members of the industry to preserve their own IP, to preserve what they have as a discriminating factor, but to, to maintain at that level of specification so they can interoperate. And so what we focused is we came back to basics, our first spiral, our first workflow, but implemented it with multiple orchestrators and separated multiple control messages and control message channels so that we could see how readily and what level we would need to abstract and how easy it was to interchange those. Um, our enterprise switch out from one to the other, we were able to do that in a matter of days. It's not automatic, it's not like you export from Invitas and you hit import on Phantom and everything runs, yay us. Um, but we are talking about days, not months, not the typical 18 months it takes for us to do a large scale architectural refresh in a typical government program. Um, but we also said we now know sort of the level of common interface that needs to be abstracted, which is enough for us to do the action, but doesn't need to get into the knickers of everybody who's customizing how they do a particular component. Um, and this really comes down to how much risk is there to being an early adopter. Um, you know, the big fear is, great, I don't want to be the first one that tries to do this because what if you guys go in a different direction? What if all the vendors then start doing this? So we said, is this a you bought a beta instead of a VHS, well that's bad. It's really bad if you bought a beta instead of a VHS and a library of 4,000 movies to run on it. And what we're basically telling you is that what we've seen is even if it switches out, the lift is relatively low. It is not complete, it is not this, um, catastrophic if we switch out. There is reason to believe that you will see re immediate return on investment even if the standards go a slightly different way and that the switch out to a different standard can be facilitated to be relatively low risk to early adopters. So, all of that said, that's what our history is. How close am I? And I am on time. I'm going to go into spiral five, which probably means I won't stay on time. Um, but if you have any like burning, you can't stop yourself questions about this, feel free to ask them now. Otherwise, I'm gonna designate some of our team and they will be available to talk about the previous spirals. Somebody just on the edge of their seat? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>